a warm welcome to all the participants this afternoon. Um, many thanks for taking the time to join in. I also want to welcome our panel. So today we only have uh, Ruth presenting. He did a great job in the morning and I'm sure he's also going to do a similar thing this afternoon. Um, your confidence. Thank you, thank you very much, Ruth. <laughs> and also just to recognize um, all the participants, uh, growers drawn from across East Africa, uh, from Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, Tanzania. So very much uh, the East African team is very well represented. And uh, those who want to recognize the East African team here, uh, our team of crop advisors, uh, I want to appreciate uh, Daisy, who is joined as our technical manager. Uh, we have Daniel Weremba, our crop advisor. We have uh, Geoffrey Moyomba, a uh, crop advisor, and uh, Katie Dionyango, who takes care of the key account customers. And not forgetting uh, Liz, who has been very instrumental in, um, in, the, in, in the background, in the organization, and Matt, uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation and for the support. So in today's uh, webinar, our focus will be on adjuvants, uh, just looking at how they enhance um, our spray coverage, penetration, and also we looked at the issue of water volumes. So today we want to tie in all this together and see how we can uh, improve the performance of our spray applications. And uh, just to let you know, uh, all participants are on mute. Uh, we have a Q&A section where you can post in your questions, comments, feedback. And uh, before the end of the webinar, we shall try our best to really respond to them. And finally, uh, we are recording the webinar for the purposes of future reference and for other trainings. And this will be accessible in our website. So we shall uh, tell you more how you can access all the presentations. And we hope you will find uh, these webinars useful. So without further ado, uh, the floor is all yours, Ruth. Run with it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Victor. And thank you all for the participants to participate this afternoon. Um, the third webinar in a row. Uh, first, we talked about uh, penetration, crop penetration and coverage. The second one was about water volumes and then how can adjuvants fit into this webinar and into a good application. So when we talk about adjuvants, I think it's good to first talk about formulations. So what are formulations? Uh, what kind of formulations do exist? And what can, later we can explain what in some cases adjuvants can add extra to the formulations coming from, uh, from a manufacturer. So first formulations, um, I think this animal, you know all well, it's walking and moving around in a meadow, eating grass, but still you have to be aware that this is a natural manufacturer of formulations. It's, it, this formulation uh, is capable to, uh, um, to emulsify fat into water. So the emulsifier is lecithin, but emulsifies the fat into water. And for that, this is one of the appearance of a natural manufacturer, a natural formula formulation side, which is walking around. So when we talk about formulations, they are in our daily life because we will, we will work with formulations yeah, all day long. Some examples are, for instance, shampoo or soap, which are hair and skin cleaners. Um, also paints, they are a formulation, a formulation of pigments. The instant coffee, which we use during break, it's a formulation for an easier use. You just have to add some hot water on it and it's finished. And then we have bathroom cleaner, for instance, which is a formulation for a safer use of chemicals. So when we come to crop protection, then why is it necessary to have a formulation? Well, to, to start with, if, if with crop protection products, uh, when they are discovered an active ingredient, 
uh, mostly where the formulation experts have to deal with is with a solid product, sometimes a liquid and sometimes a very viscous product. And yet this is the appearance. It doesn't mean that they also are really good soluble in water. And we all spray our crop protection products with water. So they have to be suitable to get into the water, to dilute in the, into the water, so they can be sprayed up on the crop and they get there. So they are the vehicles to safely deliver an active ingredient, effective, efficient, but should also be convenient. So it's easy for you to use and safe, of course. So why formulating? When you look at this, this is a nice example, which uh, the experts did in uh, Munchulin. It shows you a very viscous active ingredient. And it's, uh, they, start, they try to dilute it in water. So you can see nothing is happening. Well, perhaps then we shake it a little bit to see if it then dilutes. And we have to wait a little bit. And yes, nothing is happening. And this is what we want to show with a lot of active ingredients, this will be the case. That's why we have to make, that's one of the reasons we have to make formulations. So then we have some formulation types. It's the SL formulation. It's a soluble liquid, mainly used with uh, water soluble active ingredients, such as uh, a touchdown quattro, for instance, which is a soluble uh, active ingredient and can be diluted in water. Then we have emulsifiable, emulsifiable concentrates, a product like topaz, which can't be diluted in water. And then we have to, to with it emulsifier, we have to dilute it into water. Then we have a suspension concentrate. The carrier is water. And um, like this, this will be uh, not really diluted into the water, but it will flow, uh, but it will show it later. Then we have a flowable concentrate for seed treatment. Well, this is not a uh, formulation where we have to talk about, but you can imagine that this, this uh, formulation should really be sticky to really stick to the, to the seed skin. And so it won't fall off and it will stay there. Then we have an oil dispersion. Then the, the carrier, the, the, uh, the product where the solvent is an oil and there the active ingredient can be diluted in. And then at the end, we have a WG. Can also be a WP, but WG is an example of also safely usage of a, uh, of a uh, formulation because it is, there's no dust flying around and that's why a WG is extra safe, but it's just a granule. And when it's diluted, it's just the same as a suspension concentrate. So an example of a soluble liquid, when you look in our daily life, so in formulation is dissolved in water usually, and the spray tank, it's also dissolved in water. A nice example of this is just apple juice. The second one, the emulsifiable concentrate. The example is topaz. In the formulation, it's dissolved in an organic solvent. And when you add it in the tank, of course, it's emulsified in water. Droplets, uh, oil uh, droplet sizes will be from 0.1 to 30 microns. A nice example of this is again, our cow with the milk. Then we come to a suspension concentrate. And here's the example Amistar, and it's an SC uh, formulation as mentioned. And in the formulation, the solid, solid particles floating around in the aqueous uh, environment, in the spray tank, it's exactly the same. Particle sizes are um, from 0 0.5 to 10 microns. And a nice example is the famous uh, Bavarian uh, Swiss and Austrian beer. It's a uh, vice beer, as uh, people call it. I mean, as you can see, it's, it's not really uh, clear. Small particles 
are floating around in this beer. And it's mainly the yeast that is floating around in this beer. That's what you see here. Then we have the oil dispersion. And the oil dispersion is in the form of it, it's illumis. It's a, it's a herbicide we, uh, we have for, for, for corn. And in the formulation, it's solid, solid part, uh, particles in an oily environment. And then spray tank, it's solid particles in the aqueous uh, environment. Particle sizes differ from 0 0.5 to 10 microns. And then we come to the final one, the WG, the world of dispersible granules. As mentioned, in, in principle, it's the same as WP, but this is for a safer use of crop protection products. In formulation, it's just solid particles in solid formulation. And in a tank, it's solid part particles in aqueous environment, just like the beer from Bavaria, Switzerland, and Austria again. Particle sizes differ from 0.5 to 10 microns. So this is about the um, formulations we can have with crop protection products. The other thing is about the ingredients in a formulation. Um, so a can of crop protection products contains more than only the active ingredient. The description on the label will tell you more. For instance, an Amistar 250 SC will tell you that it contains 250 grams per liter of azoxystrobin. It is an SC formulation, so the solvent will be water. And uh, the rest of the product is more or less our own recipe. And that's not always the same for all azoxy contain azoxystrobin containing products. For instance, uh, you can see here, so the active ingredient, we, we have solvents that could, that is in this case the, the water, but we have surfactants, anti-foam, it's really important, the adjuvants built in, anti-settling, biocides, and anti-freeze. All this together makes a product that all, also can make it if that's also important to be aware that this can differ a product, one azoxystrobin from the other. So what is, for instance, very important is that we have built-in pH uh, buffers. So there are some questions about should I use a pH buffer? But our formulation experts in the UK or in Switzerland are able to create formulations that are suitable to use all around the globe. You can use them in Scandinavia and you can use them in East Africa. So you can imagine that the water quality will be completely different from a pH value or the ions that perhaps be, uh, will contain, uh, but also from temperature. We know that in general, more the uh, most of our uh, formulations will be suitable in a pH range from five to nine. So that's a wide range, and it's more or less the range of pHs that exist on our Earth in water. So this is about ingredients of a formulations. And then we come to the next slide, to adjuvants. And I want to show you a picture that tells exactly, from my point of view, what an adju adjuvant should do. You see here the nice old granny, which represents the active ingredient, and a nice young fellow, what is helping her crossing the street. Well, this is exactly what an adjuvant should do. Imagine that the old granny is the active ingredient and the young man is the adjuvant. This young man should help the active ingredient to nicely, smoothly land on the leaf surface, to cover nicely the, the leaf surface, and if necessary, also help to uh, granddaddy to get in her house, so help the AI to get into the leaf tissue. 
and that's what an adjuvant should do in addition to a formulation to help the active ingredient. But it should it also do in a very nice and gentle way. So an adjuvant should help the active ingredient, but be nice and gentle. And that's really important. You don't want to have phytotox. You don't even want to uh, your uh, uh, beneficials to be hit by this adjuvant. So key factors for choosing an adjuvant, the first one should be retention aid. Make sure the droplet will land nicely and smoothly. The second one, coverage. Improve this coverage. Make sure that the leaf is nicely covered with all the AI, the best way it can. Not in some parts more and the other parts le uh, less. No, it should be covered nicely. Improved uptake. When necessary, it should be uh, helping that getting the AI into the leaf, so the active ingredient. Make sure that it is fast into the leaf and the most as possible. What it shouldn't do is causing runoff. So when you use an adjuvant, please take care, think about the risk of runoff, especially when you still think about uh, after uh, the webinar of last week that you should use some higher vo water volumes, be aware that your runoff risk is even higher. The risk of phytotox. You don't want to have uh, plants react to the usage of products. And the last but not least is the risk on beneficials. When you use beneficials, they shouldn't be hit by the usage of a uh, adjuvant. So this is how adjuvants can help. And this is what they can cause, what we don't want. Can we come to the next slide, the modes of actions of adjuvants groups? Well, there are a lot, a lot of different uh, adjuvants uh, existing on the market. And they all have their own uh, mixture, their own rep recipe. But I think it's important to try to keep it simple. We just divide it in two or three, gr uh, two groups first. So I want to start first with the surfactants and with the oils. And each product has its most strength. So when you look at surfactants, they are the best in retention aid and the best in coverage. When you look at oils, they are the best in uptake enhancement. This doesn't mean that oils uh, don't help with retention, so they don't do anything, or they don't cover the leaf well. But the strongest point is that for organosilicons and polyglycerols for the surfactants. From the other hand, those two products, organosilicons and polygrissols, they can also uh, enhance the uptake, but not as strong as the oils do. So those are the differences. In oils, we can distinguish mineral oils and plant oils. Uh, mineral oils are from a synthetic uh, background and plant oils are from a plant origin, of course, if that's how it tells. Still, the recipes can be different, and also the plant oils can be a little bit different. Um, some things you can find on the, on the label, other things you just can't. It's about how open the manufacturer is about this adjuvant. So in general, adjuvants, they can help, especially when you spray WP, WGs, and SC formulations. It doesn't mean that you always should combine WP, WG, and SC formulations with an adjuvant. In some cases, it doesn't make any difference. But it also doesn't mean that you never have to use an adjuvant with an OD or an EC formulation. Also, that can differ. 
and it's all about understanding the product but also the experience that you can have with the product sometimes it's also that you have a sus uh, you suspect something and you have to try it but in general the wp wg and sc formulations in most cases the adjuvants can help but it also depends on the spray mixture when you mix a lot of different products, a lot of mode of actions, a lot of different formulations, it's just questionable if you still need an adjuvant or which one you should choose then. Then it's about the mode of action. Is it a systemic or a contact AI? So in other words, how important is the uptake? or is the coverage more important when you have a contact AI? Then the chemical properties. So when uptake is important, is it then hydrophilic or lipophilic uh, AI? And that can also differ, but I'll come to that later. And then the location of the pest. So where is it located in the crop, but also where does it feed itself? The trips, for instance, is uh, this superficial feeding, uh, whereas an aphid is feeding itself deeper in the leaf. So where the pest does feed itself is really important. You get most of the active ingredient on that location in the plant. It makes me curious, and uh, that's why I want to have a poll about what adjuvants have you previously used? Really curious. Organosilicons. Straight out? Yeah, straight out. Still straight out. Still straight out. Straight out. <laughs> yeah, same as this morning. Yeah, polyglycerol. Oh. Still straight out. Yeah, mineral oils. Okay. A bit more diverse this afternoon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, just wait for a couple more votes and then I'll end this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. Okay, next one is silicon. Yeah, pretty clear majority there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of people use as experience with organosilicons. It makes me even more uh, curious, Liz. So, why did they use them? There we go. Let's find out. Improved coverage. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. It's all about improved coverage. No yeah. spray retention to control oh, spider, mites. spider mites. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> understand. That's what I heard. Yeah, pretty similar to this morning, I would say. Exactly. Yeah. Improved coverage, I really can understand. By using an yeah. uh, organosilicon, you get a nice coverage or yeah. even too nice coverage. You have to be aware of that, that the spreading is that strong that you get r causing runoff. Yeah. And uh, to co control spider mites, we uh, did that on purpose and uh, really understand that. But it's, it is illegal to use it in that way, in that matter. Yeah. Still, if you have an experience with that, I can imagine, and I really uh, also appreciate your honesty in that. Okay. So, uh, for a couple of slides, I talked about what a uh, adjuvant should do: retention it, improved coverage, and improved uptake. So let's have a look at it: what it is exactly and how it works. So the first one is retention aid. So after the droplet left the nozzle, it's all mixed up. And before the droplet hits the leaf surface, it should be in place again, especially with adjuvants. And so the leaf tension is dropped. So it won't bounce off. Is that doesn't happen within one second. 
the risk of a chatter and bouncing off of the drop, uh, droplet is really high. And to show you that, of course, we made again a nice video. You're used to that, and I think it's a nice way to show what can happen. The next video will, uh, will show you some uh, dry, three different uh, ways of spraying on a brassica leaf. And the brassica leaf is a really uh, with a thick waxy layer, which is difficult to get uh, the spray drop landed on. And you can see that also, but this is a nice example what can happen. So this is the first one with only water sprayed. And you can see jumping the droplets around on the leaf surface. It's a nice uh, video, isn't it, Liz? Looks like a disco. Yeah, actually and does. And then though. we have again a formulation. Now it's a formulated product, but without any adjuvants. And still nice dancing around droplets. Now the, for the adjuvant will come in. And the droplets, the dancing is disappeared. So it shows you really what, a, what an adjuvant can do. And then to show what dynamic surface tension is, like there's a nice picture of a droplet that's laying on a lotus leaf. But to keep this droplet like this, it's only done by dynamic surface tension, by, not by, the, by surface tension. The next slide, I will show you a, a graph of dynamic surface tensions of about uh, different products. And it's a, it's a difficult one, so I will take time to explain everything. Um, I will start here at the y-axis with the surface tension. But this means how much power, well, what the forces are on the, on the surface of of a droplet, a water droplet. At the x axis, you will see the surface H. So you can see 1, 10, 100, 500, there's half a second, 1,000, that's one second. So this is 10 seconds, and this is uh, 100 seconds. So then we start with the surface tension versus surface H. This line in the top is just water. And as you can see, water is water, nothing is happening. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, our experts in Wunschwuden are able to measure all kinds of combinations and what surface tensions will bring. So this is what we show. We have instruments to do the measurements because they have they need them to do the measurements and to get the best formulations out for you. So as I mentioned, this is water. This is the plant oil, and you can see it will make a difference, but not as fast as organic silicon. This is the polyglycerol. It also makes a difference, but later than the organic silicon. Uh, but with the uh, viscosity of a polyglycerol, what's in that product, in that adjuvant, it will absorb the energy that is caused by the landing of a droplet. So it still will stick onto the leaf. It does it in a different way than organosilicon. Organosilicon does it only by dropping the, the dynamic surface tension. You can see it here. This is an organosilicon in 0.02%. This is an organosilicon in 0.05%. So it's dropping tremendously. When we look at half a second to a second, then the, after leaving the nozzle, the dropper will hit the target, will hit the leaf. If it is coarse enough, of course, not when you have really sm uh, small droplets they're just floating around 
and they will never hit the, the surface tension. We can see that the polyglycerol, as I mentioned, is not below this line, but the polymer, uh, they will take care of the energy and the droplet will nicely land. The other thing is, when we look at here, the dynamic surface tension is dropping and dropping. And when we see a 0.02% or a 0.05%, this will get into the danger zone. The danger zone for runoff. So be aware that you can have a nice uh, surface tension when the droplet is landing on the leaf surface. It doesn't mean when it's still dropping that it is okay. It shouldn't be in this region because runoff is a really a big deal in this case. So this is about retention aid. Next was coverage. When you look at coverage, we all spray this with WG formulations. This is the WG formulation solo. You can see all the droplets, really small droplets are lying on the leaf surface, but you can see a lot of dark uh, leaf surface just in between it. This is the WG formulation combined with the polyglycerol. You can see that you have a nice coverage of, uh, of the spraying. Then we go to the organosilicon. Again, you have fantastic uh, spreading because that's where an organosilicon is strong in. But you can also see that here was already some floating. And here was water collected in a dip in the, in the leaf, and here it was. This can get a little bit more dangerous uh, for the case of phytotox, etc. So this is still very good, but it looks different than the polyglycerol. Then we come to the esterified plant oil. So an oil-based adjuvant, which is strongest in uptrack improvement but helps also in retention and in coverage, but less than those two. You can see it, that the coverage is just better than the just solar formulation. It helps getting the droplet on the right spot on the leaf. It is a little bit spread, but not as strong as those two. This is about coverage. Then we go to the uptake enhancement. First, I want to show you the skin of a plant. The skin is made, is invented by the plant to protect it, to protect it for uh, water to evaporate out of the leaf, but also for other stuff to get into the leaf. That's not what was uh, what the plant wants. And that's why it designed a waxy layer. So this is a nice example of a chenopodium uh, leaf. It's a very common weed uh, all over the world. And you can see this is a really waxy leaf. Uh, when you look at the droplets on the leaf also, it's really difficult to penetrate. This is a closer look at it, where you can see here also a stomata. And then we just with an electric microscope, we have even a better closer look at it. And this is all waxy crystals which are on top of the leaf. And those waxy, waxy uh, crystals uh, make sure that the droplet will just run off or it, it can't really penetrate. So a lot of cases, the droplet is just lying on the cracks, uh, crystals and preventing the AI to get in. But that in a certain way, it can go a little bit lower, but then the second barrier will appear, and that's a cuticle, which is all of crystal, uh, waxy crystals. It's made of it, out of it. What we see here is a, uh, is a leaf, and here is the cuticle, and it's a 0 0.1 to 20 microns. Most cases, it's not 20 microns. Generally, it's just thinner. I show it here with the red lines in between, but it's of course also at the bottom side of the leaf. You have to imagine that a, um, a, a, 
an active ingredient, the molecule of an active ingredient is a thousand times smaller than this cuticle. So to get in, it has to travel a really long way. And it's a difficult way that we'll show you later. First, I want to talk a little bit about active ingredients because that's important to explain also the rest. There are two kinds of active. We have the lipophilic active ingredients, which I want to talk about now a little bit more. The lipophilic uh, active ingredient is, yeah, it likes oil and it's more like a uh, fatty waxy layer, but still to get in, it's difficult, but it's more or less the same as the waxy layer. But to diffuse for it with all the, the crystals is difficult. And that's shown in this picture. Again, we see here a leaf. This, this here is the waxy layer. And this is a leaf tissue, what you see here. And when an AI wants to penetrate into the leaf, so in this case, a lipophilic active ingredient, it has to, it will diffuse into the waxy layer, but it has to go around all those crystals. And this will make a very, very long way before the AI really reaches the leaf, the leaf tissue. And that makes it really difficult. So to test sometimes some things, uh, in um, Switzerland, they are able to, uh, to get a wax layer of a leaf and test a little bit with it. And they do it with those two dishes here. And in between, they have uh, the wax layer, which they could get off a plant, a leaf, plant leaf. They put it in between those discs. They put here, the pink one is an active as a formulation of our product and product. And then they watch and they look and they, they, they check how long it will take and how much will be in this wax, wax layer. As you can see, it's really small. It's uh, just the size of a euro. Now, people in Europe know what a euro is, but I think you can imagine also a little bit how big this coin will be. So studying the uh, uh, adjuvant effects in, uh, in the lab, we did it like this. And we see here no adjuvant. So it was just the solo formulation without any adjuvant. And they tried three different adjuvants. And they came up to that this adjuvant was the best one with the best penetration into the leaf. The difference from 40% of uptake. In time, it was zero to 80 hours. Of course, that's no practice. That's not really what will, you, will happen in practice. But for a lab, you can really test it like this. So when we have a faster diffusion due to the wax plasticization, difficult word for me, uh, it makes it easier for the AI to get into the leaf. I think you have to look at it like this. The oil is more or less becomes one with the waxy layer. It will be sucked into it. When it's in the waxy layer, it also takes with him the active, active ingredient because it was dissolved in this oil. And with that, the road is opened for the active ingredient and you can see there are some movements you can't go straight into but it's almost straight into the leaf way much easier than this one and that makes it how a lipophilic ai mainly with an oil based adjuvant can get easier into the leaf then we have the second active ingredient kind of and that's a hydrophilic and of course, hydrophilic active ingredients, they don't like a fat environment or a, a waxy environment like the leaf, uh, the, the waxy layer of leaf. So that makes it more difficult. But we think that there is a different pathway for water-soluble active ingredients. 
it can. We have here the, uh, the waxy layer of the leaf. This is the leaf tissue again. To keep the waxy layer on the leaf, there are cracks and leaf tissue that get into the waxy layer, otherwise it would just fall off. And exactly those regions is for a hydrophilic AI interesting to get into the leaf because this is really hydrophilic because it's leaf tissue. And via these regions, it's, it's possible for those AIs to get into the leaf. And then again, uh, adjuvants can be important because they take care of that uh, all parts are covered of the leaf. And also they can take care that the product can be longer in solution and has the time to get in this regions and this cracks to get into the leaf. And that's important. And that's, for instance, a way how a polyglycerol adjuvant it will do. Um, to show you what differences it can make, I want to share with you some trial results. And the first one is the control of Mitsis Persici in potted roses. It was carried out in a trial station in the Netherlands. Uh, we used here as an example a WG formulation of a lipophilic active ingredient. And it's not, it's a new product which we are developing also for Africa. And it's not a really specialized in uh, aphids. But we want to see, we know it has some effect, and we want to see if we can also improve it just as a nice side effect. So we added some oil, oil adjuvant to it. In this case, it was a, a stirified plant oil. And look how the performance was then. And as you can see, 14 days after the last application, it was some more than 30% control with the solar products and 90% control by adding just those this adjuvant to it. When you look at the numbers in untreated, it varied from 180 at the uh, start of the spraying until 614 days after the last spraying. Then we also uh, checked what a uh, hydrophilic active ingredient could do. In this case, chest is a hydrophilic AI. And we sprayed at it. And of course, it's better controlling the aphids as the uh, lipophilic AI does. You can see that it has a control of 75% at uh, six days after the third treatment. And when you uh, combine it with a surfactant adjuvant, in this case, it was the polyglycerol, we have nearly 100% of efficacy 14 days after uh, the application. Well, CHESS is a granule, as you know, and is also a hydrosoluble active ingredient. And you can see that you can improve not only the efficacy, but also the uh, long-lasting re residual effect by using this effect, uh, surfactant. Then another uh, trial to show you the difference in between the, uh, the surfactant and the oil-based adjuvant. So again, the lipophilic AI, the WG formulation, solo. Then we use the lipophilic uh, AI combined with the surfactant, in this case, again, the polyglycerol. And we use it with the uh, oil adjuvant, in this case, that's the uh, esterified blend oil. So the numbers in untreated were 32 to 42. And well, you can see the percentage control in, uh, in solo, it's about 40%. With the surfactant, it's about 60%. And um, with the, with the uh, oil adjuvant, it's about uh, in between 70 and even 80, 85%. So it's pretty strong. The efficacy is really uh, improved by that. So Les, now we come to the last question again. 
Will you use edge events differently? I'm really curious about this one. Mm, let's uh, let's see what happens. Oh, the tension. <laughs> oh yes. Oh. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Oh, yeah, got some more votes now, which is good. So one says no, seven say yes, eight says no, two say nine says yes, two say no. You've got lots of questions in the Q&A already. Yeah, I thought, and I can yeah. imagine that people say, well, I have good experience with uh, surfactant, so why should I, uh, why should I use them in a different way? I can imagine that, of course. Yeah. But I think it's good to uh, realize that there are more things you could be uh, thinking about and yeah. perhaps it can I should say try it or perhaps it makes you uh, think about it different in the future exactly lovely I'll close that now thank you everyone yeah. so this will bring us to the summary um, the first one the plant rex layer is a major bottleneck in the delivery of the active ingredient onto the target leaf surface, uh, but also into the interior of the leaf. I think we show that, and I think a lot of people will also be aware of that, of course. Then the thing is, adjuvants can sometimes help the achieve, to achieve efficient active ingredient delivery. Well, I think that's uh, really true. And I think you have really have to get your experience with all the different kinds of uh, um, adjuvants that are in the market. If you talk about organosilicon, they can differ from one brand to the another, uh, one recipe to another, but also the plant oils or the, uh, the, the synthetic oils, but also the polyglycerols, they can really differ from product to product and from, uh, from, uh, yeah, from the recipe that it all contains. So understand the adjuvant mode of action when selecting the right adjuvant for the right purpose. I think that's exactly uh, exactly described. Do you use a systemic one or is it just a contact uh, active ingredient? Is it lipophilic or is it hydrophilic? Those things you all have to think about before you, you choose your adjuvant. And understanding the following is important. The basic chemical properties of an active ingredient, of course. So as mentioned, is it hydrophilic or is it lipophilic is really important. The final destination of the active ingredient. So where do you want to have it? Do I want to control aphids or do I want to control trips? So do I have to get really deep into the leaf tissue or just superficial on the top of the leaf? And the product formulation, as mentioned, is it a WG, WP, or SC? This is the most important question you have to ask yourself. But also for other formulations, can it sometimes help to use an adjuvant? And of course, a recommendation is tailor-made, tailor-made based on knowledge and experience. And our Syngenta technical experts, well, they can help. Brings us together for the last or the final, uh, for uh, this is the final um, webinar. So that brings us back to all three of the webinars and bring it all together. So adjuvants and application quality. First is the canopy penetration. Cause for droplets to reach target deep in canopy have a higher energy, uh, higher energy. The energy absorption can be improved by an adjuvant. So that's really important. You want to uh, penetrate the crop because you don't want only uh, wet in this periphery. That could, when you do that only, you, you will cause runoff and you won't uh, control the pest for the disease that is really deep into your canopy. So you need a coarser droplet to get into. When you have a coarser droplet, as mentioned, it has a higher energy, so retention can be can be tricky. So that's when an adjuvant perhaps can extra help. The other thing is coverage. 
spreading over leaves is poor when coarser droplets are applied. That's true, but it's depending on which product you are using, which crop protection product. And adding an adjuvant can improve the spreading also on the leaf. And on the up, uh, as a positive uh, thing, when you use coarser cor droplets, you have less drift and less evaporation. So you have more product, crop protection product on your leaf. And I think that's more important. The last one optimized water volumes. Excessive water volumes can cause high runoff. And this is especially also when you extra when you use surfactants, especially when you use organosilicons. So it is really important that you don't use excessive water volumes and especially combined with organosilicons. So to end, and I hope that I can convince you a little bit of that, this, please use air induction nozzles and opt optimize water volumes to get the best effect you want to, uh, want to get. And if necessary, add an adjuvant extra to it. Asanti sana. Look at those lovely people and beautiful crop at the back. Is that true, Liz? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Thank you, Rude. So do you want to jump straight into the Q&A? Yes, I think we should. Is it advisable to add adjuvant in oil-based formulations like EC, EC or it will cause runoff? I think this is a good question and we had it last week already. I think it's uh, from the same, uh, I think from the same person, I guess. Um, to start with uh, oil-based uh, formulations like EC, uh, sometimes an uh, adjuvant can add some extra. Uh, will it cause extra runoff? I don't think so. It just if you over exaggerating with for instance, in organosilicon and high water volumes, yeah, you can cause runoff. But normally, an EC formulation is not really a spreader. It's more for the uptake uh, of the product. What is the effect of adding adjuvant to the OD formulation? Uh, that's, again, a good question. I think it's more or less related also to the EC formulation. And especially with OD formulations and really oil-based formulations, when you uh, want to combine it with an extra oil for uptake enhancement, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, no. What is the difference between ionic and non-ionic adjuvants? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a question of uh, uh, how the polarization is. Is it negative loaded or, or not? And an ionic uh, um, adjuvant is, has, an, uh, has a positive or negative load. So, and this, this makes a difference. Is it visible to use adjuvants with foliar fertilizers to improve efficacy? Is it advisable, sorry. Is it advised in uh, some cases where they wouldn't exaggerate that? And I uh, think uh, in this case, uh, the adjuvants could help more than a foliar fertilizer, but in some cases it can help, yeah, to, 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 to get more active ingredient into the leaf. Is it advisable to use adjuvants with X insecticides? Well, it's depending on which insecticide you need, but a lot of cases I can tell you, yes, it could be advisable, especially when you look at the formulations, when it's a WG, for instance, uh, in a lot of cases, it might help, but it's also depending on which insect do you want to control and how is the AI? What kind of AI is it? Why are most organosilicon based adjuvant high, have high risk on phytotoxicity on crops with thin leaf lam, lam, lamina uh, or generally soft leaf tissue? Um, I think they are more vulnerable for, for organosilicons. Um, I think they are 
the uptake of an uh, active ingredient can be uh, easier when you then have a lot of active in the at the edges of the leaf or on the tips of the leaf you're collecting more act uh, active ingredients and more product gets in too much gets in and also the uh, organic silicon will have an effect on that and then you see more phytotox which one can cause a scorch between ionic and non-ionic uh, adjuvants scorch but do you uh, can you help me here victor i think the question is asking is um which one can uh, cause damages i think in terms of phytotoxicity okay if i'm not wrong yes between the ionic and non-ionic i think both can both can uh, both can do that and that's uh, all about spreading and uh, where the product is collected now both can do what is a super spreader well organosilicons in general they are the real super spreaders and especially when you use them high uh, dose rates and high concentrations they can really be uh, uh, super spreaders product like a uh, breakthrough but it's also different difference differs from how uh, what the ingredients what the recipe has, especially as but uh, more general organosilicons are super spreaders must adjuvants be registered by the local authority for use with pesticides uh, i think this is the case in kenya but i think the, the kenyan team can answer this question better than i can do yeah basically when you claim uh an activity with a pesticide especially in terms of enhancement of performance then you must uh, declare it through trials and prove that that is the case and i can confirm that most of the adjuvants um, in kenya are actually registered alongside specific uh, products because they are claiming some uh, enhancement effect and that can really differ, for instance, in Europe, it can really differ from country to country. And also just to add, probably there's also some concern regarding environmental safety of some of the adjuvants. So in, in, in some countries, I know uh, they undergo a registration process just to make sure that uh, their safety is guaranteed to the users. Should all sprays on brassica vaccine leaves be mixed with adjuvants irrespective of pesticide formulation? No, I don't think so. It's really depending on which uh, formulation you're using. When you come to an OD formulation, I don't think I would uh, recommend that because it can also cause then mm, things you might not like to see. So no, not always. And also just to add Rude onto that question, uh, some products like for example our daconil has got an inbuilt water in it so when you spray it you don't need to add an adjuvant no no it's a really strong formulation yeah. i fully agree on that yeah that's really about experience and for some products it's it can be an extra and for other products no so especially for brassicas i would say um Look at it when you when you look at the formulation and then reconsider and then perhaps ask your 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 supplier if you need one. So I'll, my colleagues from Syngenta. If products already contained uh, adjuvants, why to use additional? Well, it's, the, it's a good question. It's a, it's just depending on if. Uh, if a formulation has good uh, built-in adjuvants, you might not need, uh, you need any extra adjuvants. But it's really about what I mentioned about uh, experience also to see if it can do something extra. And it's not always the case. I really agree with you. Not always. No. So why addition to use that additional? No, not always. Why are organosilicon based adjuvants have higher risk of phytotoxicity on plants with thin leaf structure? I think I answered that already, but I want to add some extra to it. 
I think when you use especially a high concentrations of, uh, of um, organosilicons, what I showed in the graph was the drop of the dynamic leaf uh, uh, dynamic surface tension. It can be that low that it even will uh, flow into the stomata of a leaf. So, and when it really gets the liquid just gets into the leaf by that, it will cause for sure uh, phytotox. The other thing. Yes, also Sorry, yes, continue, Ruth. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, and yeah, and it's alright. Collected on the edges of the leaf and in the dips of the leaf more, and that's why you you just get more um, phytotox. The dynamic surface tension dropping of an organosilicon is fantastic, but you should use it in the right way. Otherwise, it will, yeah, will, will cause damage. Is it advisable to use adjuvants with fungicides and, uh, and insecticides? Yeah, of course. You can use it with both, perhaps even in a mixture, if you mean that. But still, you have to figure out with which kind of products do I want to mix it? What is the mode of action? Or what is the formulation? And does it need an extra adjuvant? Is it, is it necessary? What is, the, what is the active ingredient? Is it lipophilic or hydrophilic? And then, yeah, perhaps it can, it can be of help. It's all about, uh, all about, ex about experience. And just thinking about how a product is. I got those, another one just come in. Those excess of uh, use, those excess use of organosilicon adjuvant retard the plant growth. That's uh, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't think so, really. But if it causes phytotox, well, then it will cause uh, it will uh, cause. Uh, slower growth, of course, yeah. Do you have something extra to add to that, uh, Victor? Do you have some experience on that? Yeah, I think uh, I've seen this question coming up quite a lot. And, and you just go to the history of um, organosilicons. If you look at um, herbicides, most of them were actually formulated using organosilicons because most of the weeds have um, tough, uh, tough waxy layers. Mm -hmm. And silicon is actually to break the cuticle and actually help in the infiltration of the active ingredient. So, so what sometimes you see, uh, depending on the quality of organosilicon, then uh, if the particles uh, used in the formulation are too tiny, then they tend to infiltrate through the stomata and actually cause death um, of, of, of the cells. So yeah. sometimes you get that phyto. And of course, if you damage the cells uh, of a leaf, then uh, you also interfere in the process of photosynthesis. So the plant yeah. will not be able to manufacture food that it requires for its growth. And you know, fundamentals, what you need is actually um, uh, the head size. So if the leaf is not able to manufacture the food, then you compromise on the quality of the crop as well. Yeah. And uh, the plant will get into survival mode and it will produce more, it will use more energy by control the damage that is uh, made by something like that. What is the science of organosilicon controlling spider mice? I think this is also a good one for you, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, there, there are many schools of thought. So one is um, the physical effects, uh, mainly for, of suffocation. And uh, there's also the belief that uh, when you have uh, an organosilicon on the body of an insect, then the water tends to rush too fast inside the trachea because you know the trachea of an insect will actually open because of the oxygen and carbon dioxide tension. So if that is not uh, well controlled, then there's too much water that goes through the trachea of the insects. And uh, some will say it will actually burst. So there are those two uh, methods, uh, uh, those two things that people talk about. But again, you know the dangers. If you use uh, very high rates of the surfactants, 
then you could also end up getting phyto. Mm -hmm. At what temperatures do adjuvants perform better? Well, in general, I would say uh, we discussed it last week that you shouldn't spray with at too high temperatures and to a uh, low uh, air, um, relative humidity. But um, when you ask me in this way, I would say you saw that uh, uptake of an active ingredient uh, can be improved, for instance, by, uh, with a, an um, oily adjuvant. So when the uptake is uh, faster done, and with high temperatures, the water evaporates also easier from the lee surface. I would say with higher temperatures, it would be uh, help more helpful. On the other hand, uh, I still I would say be careful with that, because an experience with low temperatures and uh, with a strong mixture can't mean that uh, the strong mixture is still uh, safe for the plant at higher temperatures. And I don't know what you mean exactly with what temperatures. If it is 35, but I want to stay in the normal temperatures, so around 20, 25 degrees perhaps, and that's it. Maybe I, I could add probably, does temperature affect uh, an adjuvant, whether it is uh, an, uh, an ionic or an ionic? Is there an effect of temperature? Sorry? Uh, where, where you have um, uh, an ionic and non-anionic um, adjuvants, yeah. the neutral adjuvants and the charged adjuvants, does temperature affect the performance? Well, I don't think so, uh, Victor, because in the, it's all about um, when you have a, an ionic uh, adjuvant, there is a, uh, an extra ion put to it to get it neutral. Uh, when it's in solution, it's it's gone already. So I don't think there will be a big, big difference in that. I don't think so. But that's mm -hmm. uh, something uh, I, I have to uh, check also. I don't know. I can't answer you that question. Okay. Organosilicons kill mites at higher rates of suff uh, by suffocation and physical action. I think this is more a uh, an extra um, a help to the former question about the effect on uh, mites, I guess. Or do you have something to add to this? I don't think so. Yeah, it's, it's the, same, the same thing I was mentioning about the physical action. Exactly. This yeah. is really appreciated. This is help from the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Is there any effect of temperature on adjuvant effectiveness? I think this is more or less the same question uh, which was already uh, posted. Um, I think when you look at the, uh, the help of an ad adjuvant, um, yeah, well, let's bring it in this way. Uh, when the temperatures are higher, the, up the evaporation of the water, spray water, will be, of course, also higher. So the, the crop is earlier dry. So, and when it is dry, when the spray liquid is dry, there will be no uptick anymore. So when it's really uh, low humidity and high temperatures, the, the uptick is gone. So when you have a, uh, an adjuvant, when you use an adjuvant and the uptake is improved, it's faster in the plant, it can help from that perspective. Does adjuvants on higher rates have efficacy on mealybugs? Don't have any experience on that, but I think you have more I have to think about when I use an adjuvant, do I get more uptake into the crop? And from that perspective, I have more AI that can control the mealybugs, but I don't have any experience on that. I think that's it for the questions for now. That's 21, that was really good. Those yep. are questions. Mm. Okay, so, um, oh, one more. Oh. Just at the end. Does pH of water affects the efficacy of adjuvants? Uh, 
No, I don't think so. I think that that will depending also on the uh, on the recipe of that particular adjuvant. But I can't really answer that. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in our crop protection products, the whole formulation is created like that, that it will buffer uh, in the pH. So in the pH range between five and nine, most of our products are suitable for that. So what an adjuvant will do, it's there are some uh, pH buffers which are called uh, an adjuvant, but I think the adjuvant should help for retention, coverage, and uh, of, uh, uh, enhanced uptake. So, no, can't answer that. Does does adjuvants have any control with white flies? Well, in combination with an active ingredient, of course. And when it's a, for instance, a lipophilic or a hydrophilic, doesn't matter. You have to choose your adjuvant, and when this adjuvant will help that the AI that you have more uptake of the active ingredient into the plant. Yes, that will help. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for, for joining everybody and also thank you for uh, so many questions. Oh, these guys, you just think. Yeah, it's another one. You ready? Sorry? There's another question in there. Is, okay. Yeah. Is a pH of eight and above, what is advised to use to uh, this assist defy the water spray, the spray water? As mentioned for our products, a uh, pH of eight shouldn't be any issue. And uh, we have uh, our formulations are created like that. It can handle this kind of pH. So that wouldn't be any problem. I'm scared to stop it now, just in case it's another <laughs> one. <laughs> Okay, I think we are done this time. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Rude. Thanks, Victor. Um, just as a final thing, all of these webinars, as we said at the start, have been recorded. So if you just search on our website, you'll see um, the Learning Hub and you'll be able to access all of these webinars. This one will be up in a couple of days. Um, so, so make sure you go back and check them out and give them a second watch. Just one more thing, Liz. Um, I would like to take this chance to acknowledge our commercial unit head, uh, well, our managing director, Mr. Fredo Tieno, is on the call. I'm sure most of you have not met him before, uh, but when we have a forum where we, uh, we could introduce him to you, then uh, we'll invite him. So he's on the call, he cannot talk, he's on mute like the rest of us. But uh, when you have a forum, then uh, I will introduce him uh, to most of you. So thank you very much. Lovely. I want to thank all, everybody for the nice uh, question, for the good questions. And uh, I hope you have a very good season again.